So my job at Autodesk is uh, I'm the Director of Applied Research and Innovation. Uh, we're part of the office of the CTO and our job is basically to figure out what's going to matter to the company in the future and then help the company get ready for that potential future. So typically we look five to a hundred years into the future. Um, right now we're focusing primarily on uh, advanced robotics, machine learning and AI, Internet of Things, additive manufacturing and I think most interestingly how all of those things come together and um, sort of get mashed together to create interesting, uh, interesting futures. So 3, 3D printing has been uh, really important to Autodesk in the last, I would say even 15 years um, as a core area of innovation internally but also um, you know, a, a massive development outside um, that I think is, is going to profoundly shape the future of industry. Um, specifically, uh, my interest is mostly in industrial um, additive manufacturing, um, not so much the consumer stuff, um, which is fun, it's creative, kids love it, um, but I think the big impact globally, economically, um, in terms of innovation is really on the industrial side. Um, what we're specifically interested in um, now, so over the last decade or so, we've been um, certainly observing uh, the developments in the technology uh, in, the, in the hardware side. We've been developing software um, to make 3D printing better, easier, um, more, more accessible um, by, by more people because in the early days it was actually quite difficult to, to get good results. Um, so uh, we have a platform called the Spark platform which is being adopted by many um, 3D printer manufacturers as their um, sort of core software platform, and uh, which is going great. Uh, my particular interest is in the future, so um, we're looking at really breaking down the limits, the, the barriers that 3D printing has, and you know those are size. So it's easy to print something the size of a bread loaf. It's difficult to print anything bigger, so we want to break that. Um, cost, it's still relatively expensive to print. Um, especially in high-performance materials. Uh, speed is still relatively slow. Um, and possibly the most interesting is the material question. So, um, you know, if you look at uh, standard FDM technology, you get some plastic parts that might be good for a prototype, um, might be maybe good for a mold, but as a working part are not usable. Um, and, um, and so we're really trying to push the envelope with, with high-performance materials that um, when the print is complete, that's the object, you're done. Uh, uh, which is a, a key part of our research. So we're looking at metals, we're looking at um, carbon fiber reinforced thermoplastics, uh, we're looking at carbon fiber filament uh, deposition, um, and, and so forth. So you know, these are exciting because you have the 3D printing process and then you end up with something you can actually use. Um, it could actually be part of a car, it could actually be part of an airplane, um, and, and so forth. So the MX3D Bridge in Amsterdam is a project that um, we've been involved with since the very beginning. Um, we saw uh, Joris Larman's work um, on the internet and um, some of his earlier work, and um, so I actually flew out to, to meet him in Amsterdam. Um, became an instant fan of uh, not only his work, but his, his way of thinking. Um, he's a brilliant artist and, and designer, and so we started talking about this vision for a um, a beautifully designed uh, bridge using um, generative design technologies um, that uh, would then be 3D printed by robots um, using um, high rate wire deposition technologies to print it in situ. So before robots, two on each bank of the canal, they would start to print and they'd pull themselves along further along the bridge, keep printing, pull themselves along until the bridge uh, would meet in the middle. Um, that was a couple of years ago now. We've been working um, on our side at Autodesk on some uh, novel software approaches to solve these problems. Um, Joris and his team at MX3D have been working on the robotics um, and the deposition technology, and we're hoping to start to print um, towards the end of, of this year. So some of the new technologies that, that we're working on um, 
again, are for me really about combination. Um, so um, take robotics for instance, which I actually think is an interesting underlying platform for additive manufacturing. So you have a six axis industrial arm, you put something on the end of it that can squirt out material of some kind, you have a very nice 3D printer. Um, one of the difficulties is, um, so the machine is a wonderful machine, very accurate, relatively inexpensive, widely available. I can pick up the phone and have a robot here in a few days. The problem is it'll take me six months before the robot does anything interesting. They're very difficult to talk to. So one of the things we're working on is um, certainly a layer of software that makes that a lot easier so that I can program the robot maybe the way I would animate um, something in a piece of animation software like Maya. Um, and we're making good progress there, but really the vision is to go to the next level and use machine learning um, and apply machine learning to robotics so that the robots can just figure out what they're supposed to do all by themselves. Um, I'm tired of having to tell the robot, you know, move from this point to this point in space to this point in space and make sure your elbow doesn't hit this thing over here. Um, it's ridiculous. I should just be able to tell the robot, I want this object to be moved somehow from here to here. Figure it out on your own. Um, and that's really, um, I think, a sweet spot for, for machine learning. One of the interesting things is if, if you figure that out for one robot, so one robot learns how to move this thing from here to here, what happens at that moment is all robots know that. Um, so you have this, this parallelism and scalability that humans don't have in, in robotics and in computation, with it, which I think is super interesting. One thing I would encourage people to look at is um, this, this new um, Fusion, and forgive the name because we have a really cool product called Fusion, but um, w which actually is part of this workflow. Um, but this, this fusion of disciplines that together result in things that were previously impossible um, and, and cannot be realized without each of these things. So I'll give you an example. If you take generative design, so generative design is this whole class of computational tools that um, basically design tools that unlike CAD, so CAD is computer-aided design, no CAD system has ever helped or aided anybody. There's no help there. Um, what the CAD system does is it simply records the intentions of the engineer or the designer um, that that person already has in their head. So I already have the design more or less in my head and I, I feed my will into the computer and it documents that and then maybe I can do simulation and nice renderings and stuff. So they're powerful tools, but in terms of generating new geometry, new ideas, there's no, um, there's no intent on the, on the machine's part. Generative design is different. So generative design, I simply start um, with my goals, so what, do I, what I want to accomplish, and then my constraints. It has to be as light as possible, maybe there's an attachment point here, it has to carry something. Um, I give those inputs to the system, and then the computer returns a geometric result. So it's basically creating geometry all by itself. No human ever drew anything. Okay, great, that's whiz bang and special, that's wonderful. Where it gets super interesting is that system can also be told the means of manufacture. So how is this thing actually gonna get made? Is it gonna be milled? Um, is it gonna be cast, injection molded, or 3D printed? And that's where it gets interesting because the computer can come up with geometries that the human can't. So way more complex, right? Um, which is nice, but if I can't make it, it's not very interesting. But now that I have these 3D printing technologies, I, actually, I can actually make um, these geometries that a human couldn't have uh, designed. Beyond that, you can actually start to get kind of a feedback loop between these systems. Um, you can develop new materials to 3D print, so that's um, what we did with Airbus. Um, um, we we uh, generatively designed a cabin partition um, together. Uh, that was then optimized based on a new alloy that they developed for 3D printing. Um, so there were sort of several cycles of optimization leading up to this part that um, will be flying in aircraft soon. Um, that is, in this case, half the weight of the previous part and also stronger. Um, so it's these sort of self-reinforcing um, loops between these different technologies that lead to the really interesting stuff. I mean, you know, what I would advise against is using 3D printing to do something you can already do any number of other ways that usually doesn't lead anywhere interesting because you can machine it more, you know, less expensively, you can injection mold it more easily, um, but the interesting bit is to come up with ideas that you can't make any other way but with 3D printing, and to me that's where the magic happens.